Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas and we do post every Friday so do hit subscribe and follow our continuing adventure so you too can become the horticulturalist that Stephen is. Well let's hope we all are. <laughs> Don't forget too that we do our Monday shorts. So if you've got a question, a burning horticultural query that you'd like me to answer, put it in the comments below and make sure you tell me where you're from so that I've got context and I'll see if I can answer your question. Burning up, burning yeah. up with your burning horticultural questions. But I think Stephen, the yes. subject of today's video might be quite obvious. Yes, well, it is a bit. It's now sort of mid to late winter here in uh, southern Australia. Can and I just say it is blowing a gale and it's glacial here yeah, Stephen so yeah. I'll attest to that. Yes exactly so yes the weather is proving the season this morning but what we want to talk about today are bulbous and not all things that we're going to look at today are true bulbs some are tubers and rhizomes and oh, okay. corns. Already a curveball. Yeah but anyhow bulbousy things that flower in that mid to late winter period to cheer us up in our gardens. Well that, I can already, am I smelling something from that? No, you're smelling the shrub that's up oh. over there. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna say, and they smell, but they don't. No. Well, that's a great place to start is cyclamen. Now, it is. Last year, we actually made, a, I will call it an epic, a cyclamen epic, where we looked at um, all the species that you have throughout the year. Yeah. But right now it's uh, late winter, so we're just going to look at winter flowering ones. So yes. what have we got first of all? Well, they're all the same species, but they're oh, okay. different forms thereof, which is part of the fun of this group. Yeah. Because there's different leaf patterns, different leaf shapes, yeah. different flower colours. And so although it's the smallest genus of some mid 20 species, yeah. there's lots and lots of different forms of each species. So you can keep yourself happily entertained by collecting them for the rest of your life. As you do, yeah. Mr. Sickleman. And actually, if these are the same species, yeah. I can already see a big difference in yes, the leaf. Yes, you so, can indeed. So what is it? This is Cyclamen coum, spelt C-O-U-M. Uh, like all of the other species, bar one is a Mediterranean plant. What's Gro the one? Somaliensis from Somalia, ah. <laughs> which is not in cultivation to my knowledge at this point in time. Uh -huh. uh, so Somalia can't really be considered Mediterranean, I believe. No. So all the rest grow right around the Mediterranean basin, mm -hmm. uh, up into the hills in Italy and France and so forth as well, of course, and yep. on many of the um, of the islands. So Cyclum and Coombe fits into that quite nicely. You'll find it growing in parts of Greece, some of the uh, Mediterranean islands, and it is just the prettiest little chubby, rounded petaled flowering cyclamen. And the leaves are invariably almost heart-shaped and they vary from straight dark green right through to putery leafed ones. And you yeah. can see this one here is nearly all putered. You can yeah. get fully putered leafed Beautiful ones as well. Beautiful leaves. And the flower color varies from pure whites right through to the dark carmony pinks. And here we have a very pale pink one with completely plain green leaves. I was going to so, say, if you compare the leaves, you would think that this was a completely different species. Yeah, yeah. so they are remarkably diverse. And funnily enough, coom is probably one of the species with less diversity than some others. Wow. So, for instance, take the autumn one, Hedrifolium, it has amazing foliage variation. Yeah. So um, a few things to talk about then. Obviously, right. we know the season that they're flowering, which is now, which is wonderful. Yep. Um, these are all growing in pots, as we can see. So the first thing is cyclamen, species cyclamen, make great tub specimens. They can be grown very well in pots. I find they naturalize, or well, they're not going to naturalize in pots. They self-seed better. I think, in the open ground than they do yeah. in pots. Uh, because so, of their anti-friends. Yes, that's right. The ants pick up the seeds and run around with them and drop them in all sorts of unexpected places. Yeah. And the other interesting thing about them is if you are collecting different leaf forms, mm. if you keep your different leaf forms fairly well isolated, then you'll tend to get seedlings similar to the parent plant. Yeah. So if you've got a really good pewtery silvery one, you can easily isolate that one away somewhere else yeah. and most of its seedlings will come up that way you cull out any that aren't, and you can end up with a drift of basically all the one sort of form. Otherwise, they're going to yeah. hybridise and form yeah. new wonderful forms. Yeah, and you'll end up with a sort of a tapestry effect. So it's really about what you're trying to create as far as effect is, either in pots or in the garden. So um, if you're growing them in pot culture like this, Sun, shade? Well, they, look, they all need um, winter light. They don't need a lot of sun, but they not like as much light as they can get in the winter. And they need some summer shade, so they don't want to have um, 
direct sun on them, they warm up more in a pot than they will in the ground. So you've got to be extra careful and vigilant that they don't get too hot and bake in the pots. Yeah. So a nice shady spot in the summer, uh, perhaps even under a bench somewhere where they're um, uh, well out of the sun and they're not getting too much rain on them when they're dormant in the summer. Otherwise the bulbs will rot. But I guess conversely, you don't want them to dry out in the growing season and in no. a pot they will dry out faster. Yeah, you've also got to keep an eye on that. I mean, they're winter growing, so in theory they should be getting enough rain as long as they're out in the open. But yes, there's a little bit more uh, technical requirements when you're growing them in pots mm. as what there is if you're putting them into the ground. Now, if you were going to try and grow them in the ground, what is its hardiness? Cyclamen coom is probably almost second hardiness rating in the genus, I would have said. Oh. Uh, and it can be covered in snow, it can be frozen solid and the leaves and flowers might even sort of flop to the ground and then when it thaws out it'll all stand up again. So okay. they can be grown in most parts of uh, temperate to cold areas of the world, like a lot of these plants forget the tropics they're not mm. going to do well in those sort of conditions you know what you've got other great plants in the tropics yeah well exactly yes those of you who live in those areas i'm jealous of you of the things you can grow and so in terms of cyclamen that flower at this time of year it's just corn uh, this is the basic one that flowers at this time of the year so yeah. the autumn ones can sometimes sneak into the winter a bit yeah. and the early spring ones can also come back a little bit so mm. they can all sort of cross over a bit mm. but certainly coom is the main winter species well Fantastic. And we also just should point out a million thanks to John, um, who lives in the area, who is the bulb collector, who has dropped off all his um, potted specimens for yes, us today. Yes, he grows them far better than I do, so it's <laughs> lovely to be able to borrow his. All right. I just want to show everyone this one once again, because that is so beautiful. We'll Isn't do close-ups of all of them. It's wonderful soft pink, and I quite like the fact that it's actually got plain green leaves. Yeah, I do. Because it shows up the flowers better, mm. perhaps, than the variegated leaf ones would. So, so, so different. Okay, so that's Cyclamen done. Done, Stephen yes, Ryan. Cyclamen 101. What is the next group we're going to look oh, at? If I don't drop the pot, now, there's some of the um, hoop petticoat style of daffodils. Um, I'm going to get this other one. Yes, it's quite a heavy pot, so be careful there. These are hybrids, of course, so yep. they've been bred. But they come from a range of species, again, that come from uh, Morocco, uh, southern Spain, France, and what have you. Uh, this is one of John's hybrids uh, that he's obtained from somewhere. But it's a hybrid between Narcissus cantabricus and Narcissus romeuxii. And it has beautiful open, what they call petunioid flowers. Uh, like a, yeah, Like a petunia. <laughs> Big creamy white flowers on it. For the size of the plant, they're quite remarkable. And these particular types of daffodils make great pot plants. Mm. So we can put that one down and look at the one you've got here. And that's, and that's another one of Rod Barwick from Tasmania's hybrids called Ben Bleur. It has a nice open trumpet, which is what all the breeders go for. They're trying mm. to produce those lovely open flattened trumpets. Uh, it's a good flowerer. This has got, I don't know, 10 flowers out, but it's probably got another 30 flower buds still to come. Yeah. It's got good, strong hybrid vigour. Uh, I have to say Rod Barwick is probably one of Australia's best breeders of miniature narcissus of different forms, mm. and he's produced some corkers over the years. Now I can, there's a very vague fragrance. Some of one. them do have a very slight scent, yeah. um, but again, it's more about the, the flowers, the shapes and colours, and they are generally fairly easygoing plants to grow. So two things though, um, obviously these are growing in pots. Mm. I would also think that as the plant is quite small, it would be easily missed in a garden. So perhaps growing them in pots is oh, a better option. It has as a opposed few, to your standard yeah, yeah. higher daffodil. It has some great advantages. I mean, if you've got a rock garden, then things are always diminutive in form anyway. You yeah. don't want a great big blousy tulip standing in And a bit elevated of, anyway. Yeah, and mm. often a bit elevated. Yeah. Uh, but the Cantabricus group, the Bulbacodiums, they need a good dry summer dormancy. So growing them in pots is actually quite a good idea. Yeah. You can dry them off nicely in the summer. They don't mind being out in the light a bit. They don't even mind baking in their pots a bit in the summer. Mm. And with certainly some of the varieties and species, they actually flower better if they get a good summer baking. So if they stay too cool and a little bit of moisture around them, you'll get lots of leafy growth the next year, yeah. but very few flowers. So you do have to treat them a little mean to keep them flowering well. So ideal pot culture. And I just in terms of the medium, you might be able to see there that John 
dresses the top of all of most of his yep, pots. Most of his pots with some quite sort large of gravel, gravel or sand. Mm. This helps keep the weeds down. It also discourages the slugs and snails a little bit because yeah. uh, they love the flowers of some of these hoop petticoat daffodils. Yeah. It just makes the whole thing look dressed up. And it does. I mean, if you're going to grow them in pots, you might as well have them looking as nice as possible. Well, these are beautiful. So thank you, John, for the, what are they? The hoop, hoop petticoats or bulbacodium style daffodils. Bulbacodiums, there we are. Yeah. Well, they are stunning. All right, what's yeah. the next group? All okay, right. next cab off the midwinter flowering rank. Are one of my favorite groups. Really? Yes, and they've become a oh. serious collectors. People are obsessed. Let's tell people what they are. What All are right, they? They're galanthus or galanthus. The true snowdrops. Snowdrops. And People, particularly in England, for some reason or another, have become absolutely obsessed by them. Can I say, I kind of don't get it. No, I don't either. I mean, I, I love them as a group of flowers. If we look at the cyclamen that we were just looking yeah. at, because of the variety, the leaves, I could understand getting obsessed oh, yeah. with cyclamen. Mm -hmm. But you know what? <laughs> yeah, yes. Another hate, white flower with I green dots. I hate to be dismissive, but not a lot of variety. Although there is a yellow one, isn't it? Well, it's the yeah. Holy Grail. Yeah, it has yellow ovaries, so it's yellow at the top there instead of green. Yeah. And the speckling inside on the inner petals is yellowy green. Ish. It's and a long there's, bow. And there's double ones, and you know, so there are variations in it, but they are all basically in patterns of green and white. So <laughs> I don't know why somebody would pay hundreds of pounds for a new snowdrop. Snowdrop mania. Yeah, and why people would go out of their way to steal them. I mean, people have had their seriously important snowdrops stolen from their collections and things in England. Okay. Uh, for me, it's more about having a lovely big clump of any given species. I don't much care which one it is mm. because en masse as a, a drift in the garden, snowdrops are stunning, but to a certain extent, it really doesn't matter which is which. And over the years, I've bought some quite rare ones and now I'm not quite sure which was which. And it all gets a little hard. And so unless you're a real devotee of yeah. the genus, yeah. and so we'll probably get lots of hate mail from devotees of the genus. Apologies yeah. to the snowdrop lovers of yeah. the world. They're called galanthophiles, by oh, the way. galanthophiles. Yes, yeah. the galanthophiles of the world. Uh, good luck to you. Uh, but when they breed the blue one, I'll be particularly interested. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah so they're all little green and white numbers. Again, I find them better in the ground than in pots. John's done quite well with them in pots. This one is Caucasicus. Th could we just, is it the depth of the pot? I mean, Well, they do not... like a deeper pot where they can stay cool. Yeah. Because Galanthus in general don't like a hot, dry summer dormancy either. Right. So they're more woodlandy bulbs or they'll grow in amongst rocks in, in so cool climates. Unlike the, um, the hoop petticoat daffodils, yep. These don't want to no. be baked. And they do have some variation. I mean, I've got uh, a little tiny one here, and you'll note that the leaves on most are grey green. Yeah. This one is dark green. What's uh, yours? <laughs> this one is Winoei, which is one of the tiniest of the snowdrops. Mm. Uh, only for the real devotee, I will attempt to put it up a little closer to the camera. We'll do close up. Yeah, so you can see it. <laughs> this is definitely only for the collector, I would have said, because mm. it's so tiny. Uh, but it's fun to see it and to get some sense of the differences in scale, at least. And that's something snowdrops do you want to hold can that do. Closer to this one. Yeah, see, there's quite a distinct variation. Yeah. And that's not the biggest of the snowdrops. There are one or two that even get larger than that one. I must say, though, that would look beautiful once it's bulked up in a pot of those small shiny oh, yes. green leaves. So what have I got here? That's Caucasicum. Uh, so from the Caucasus Mountains? Yes, that's the area it would have come from. Not yeah. that it's restricted to there necessarily. So actually we haven't covered that. What is their natural range? Uh, again, they sort of tend to go around the northern part of the Mediterranean. So they go right through to the Caucasus and you'll find them in Greece and Turkey and uh, uh, Italy. You'll find them in England as well, but there is some debate as to whether the English snowdrop is in fact originally a native of England. Mm. There's some talk about it having been uh, uh, brought into England by the Romans. Uh, like like so, rabbits, yeah, so, like many other things. Yeah, so when does it become a native? I don't know. Anyhow, mm. it's accepted as a native in England by most people. Yeah. And they are charming late winter flowering bulbs. Yeah. Again, for the slightly woodlandy type conditions in the garden, they don't cope well with tropical climates. Mm. Uh, they don't want to be too hot and dry in the summer. So some of our more arid regions are probably problematic for them. And they do like a good winter chill too. So a bit of frost, a bit of cold yeah. helps the snowdrops no end. 
pot culture then, would you be having these in full sun or dappled light? Uh, I'd have them out in the sun while they're in flower in the winter. Yeah. Uh, but I'd probably sink the pots into a garden bed somewhere over the summer if I was going to keep them in pots, mm. just to try and keep the bulbs that little bit cooler because otherwise okay. they can get too warm in those pots. All right. So we've got one more here. Well, oh, that's, that's just same. a larger form of Caucasicum. Oh, I so see. So that's the other thing. Some of these things will get bigger flowers, bigger stems, yeah. uh, taller, uh, but can still be the same species, but just from a slightly different geographical range mm. uh, or a different form that's shown up. Mm. So again, you know, uh, the aficionados will say, oh, yes, well, you know, a good large flowered form, blah, blah, blah. That actually uh, does look lovely in the park. Oh, it's gorgeous. But really, when you see them in the garden, if you've got a nice big drift of them or a big solid clump of them, as long as you haven't got the little dwarf ones growing next to the really big ones, because mm. that then makes them look like runts. Um, <laughs> so it's better to keep your- Expensive runts. Yeah, expensive runts. So it's better to have one variety in a nice solid mm. clump. Like the cyclamen. Yeah, yeah. So Because they will hybridize, wouldn't they? Uh, the galanthus can hybridize, although they don't hybridize as readily and it's hard to tell when you've got a hybrid sometimes anyway. Right. But we'll show you a clump of one of my double ones in the garden here so that you can see what it looks like when it's a nice clump in the garden. Yeah, okay. Well, galanthophile tick. Yeah. Well, this is how you should see snowdrops in the garden as a big, solid clump, or even better, a great drift. But anyhow, I've got a nice solid clump here of one of the double flowered ones. Its name is Lavinia and it's one of the greater X hybrids from England. Uh, dates back quite a way. Lavinia has a very nice formal double flower with green extending almost to the outside of the inner petals. But of course, like most snowdrops, to see the beauty of the inside of the flower, you have to pick it up and, and have a closer look. This colony is growing in what I would class woodlandy type conditions. Above me, I've got large maples. There's a, a, a big uh, hazelnut tree. So in the winter, it gets plenty of light because uh, the light filters through the bare branches of the trees. But in the summer, this area here is comparatively shady. And of course, it's got lots and lots of lovely leaf mold that's been naturally falling in around them, which of course the snowdrops love. Right, next cab off our rank is crocus. Obviously, this one's not open. No, and crocuses can be one of those challenging plants because they only open when there's enough sunlight on them. Mm -hmm. So you can leave for work in the morning and the crocuses will be closed. And then by the time you come home from work in the evening, still they'll closed. still be closed, but they will have opened potentially during the day. Mm. Um, so they can be a bit of a challenge. They're not long flowering. Most crocus species are very fragile in the flowers, so they don't last very long. Mm. But there's a lot of species and they flower over quite a prolonged period. Yeah. So if you collect them a bit, you could actually end up with uh, crocuses in flower for months. Yeah. So there are some true autumn flowering ones, which includes the saffron crocus. Right. And they go right through the winter ones into the high spring ones. Mm. This one, which I'm very fond of, is uh, crocus imperati. And I'm fond of it mainly because it gets that beautiful striped back yes. to the flower. Uh, so you've got this sort of almost greyish effect with purple stripes on it, oh. which makes it, I think, a particularly pretty crocus. And many of them do that. And this one has beautiful stripes too. This one hasn't opened, unfortunately. Yes, and that was Gypsy what? Girl. Oh, Queen. Gypsy Dancer, Gypsy. Gypsy. Yeah, it was a Gypsy something. Oh, we've forgotten the name, or yeah. we promised we wouldn't. Yeah, and we have, but it's Gypsy something or <laughs> gypsy another. Gypsy something. People will tell us, I'm sure. So these again are from John's collection. And so he's been very kind to uh, uh, allow us to use them today. But you can see that crocuses, true crocuses, have quite large goblet shaped flowers and most of them, except for the autumn flowering species, which tend to come up with the leaves after the flowers, mm. most of them come up with leaves and flowers at the same time. And they make lovely um, additions to the rock garden. Uh, and again, like a lot of these bulbs, they need a dry summer dormancy. Mm. I wouldn't say a baked dry summer dormancy, but a reasonably dry one. So again, let's talk pot culture. These, to my mind, are in very, very deep pots in comparison to the size of the plant. Yeah, yeah. John does tend to plant his bulbs in quite deep pots. Yeah. And I understand why, because if you take a bulb out when it's in growth, its root system can be quite a way below the bulb. So if you put it in a shallow pot, the roots tend to go that way. They can't feed themselves as well. They can't um, uh, suck up moisture as well. Uh, so if you put them in a deepish pot, right. it keeps the bulbs cool and it gives them adequate depth to, in fact, 
um, uh, let their roots extend right down to the bottom. That makes a lot of sense. And again, are these Mediterranean basin plants? Yeah, again, most of the crocuses, yes, do tend to come from Greece, Turkey, uh, right round into the Lebanon, across into Italy and France. I've seen them growing in the wild in France. And uh, North Africa and Morocco? Uh, not so much on the south side of the um, Mediterranean. It's more the north side of the Mediterranean mm. where most of your crocuses come from. And of course, many of them come from Corsica and Crete and all those sort of places as well. So yeah. the islands as well. So this is an interesting little sub-theme about bulb evolution in the Mediterranean basin. Yeah, because well, yeah, it's a hot spot. Yeah. Uh, South Africa is also, but yeah. very different sorts of bulbs, and none of these things are native to that area. Yeah, yeah. So certain Mediterranean style climates, which includes the true Mediterranean plus South Africa, California, they have their own range of bulbs that grow there. Uh, funnily enough, Australia doesn't have a bulb rich flora. Mm. We have some, but we don't have, mm. uh, if you go to Western Australia, you would assume the climatic zone would be ideal for bulb uh, growing. And yet we don't have a range of native bulbs like they have in South Africa or the mm. Mediterranean. Mm. And I don't know quite why that's happened. But uh, those sort of climates do encourage bulb uh, development because, of course, they have to be able to go through a dry period mm. in a dormant state because mm. they can't keep themselves up above ground all year round. Yeah. Of course, lots of introduced bulbs have gone mad in Western Australia because the climate is perfect for yeah. them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some anyway, of those that's weedy story. Watsonias, other things. Yeah. Now, we've got another little late winter flowering crocus here, and this is a form of crocus seabari. And when that opens up, it's a lovely rich mauve with a golden throat. Mm. Uh, and mauve and gold go very well together as a colour combination, Good I think. Know. So there's three little crocuses out of the hundreds of different crocuses one could possibly grow. And do these elicit the same kind of fervour as Galanthus? No, they don't seem to, and yet there's such huge diversity. I know there are serious crocus collectors out there, yeah. but it's not quite the same sort of intensity. And certainly I don't know of anybody that's paid stupid, of stupid amounts of money uh, <laughs> to buy the latest crocus that's come out. So what do we have here? Whoa, heavy, John, heavy pot. Yes. This is barely viewable. Can you see that, viewers? <laughs> now that, Big pot, tiny that flower. That is not a, a crocus, though. Okay. Now, we've got a colchicum here, one of the winter flowering colchicums. Okay, now if you were to show me that yeah. crocus yeah. and that flower, yes, the size is different, but I've never understood the difference between colchicum, colchicum and crocus. Well, they're actually in a different group of plants altogether. They're not even are in they? the same plant family. Uh, the crocuses are in the Iridaceae family. Mm -hmm. uh, the colchicums are in the, I think actually they were considered in the Amaryllidaceae family, but I think they're now in Colchiaceae family, I think. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look it up. But so they're in a different plant group. They have a different number of stamens. They have oh. a different um, petal arrangement. There's quite a number of variant things about Obvious colchicums. differences. It's, well, not that obvious. But no. And, and that's why a lot of these colchicums are also known as autumn saffron or autumn crocus, autumn crocus. Uh, or what have you, yeah. even though they're not truly crocuses at all, mm. uh, certainly not botanically. Mm. Um, and this one is... Well, it's supposed to be Colchicum zevotsii, but it says on, on John's label underneath white. So if zevotsii is meant to be white, then this isn't it. If in fact it comes in a pink form as well as a white form, this maybe it. it could still be it, but John got the pink one and not the white one. There you go. And obviously these have been hybridized to produce massive, I've got some hybrids which are massive. Yeah, some of the hybrids are quite big, but I have to say this one is one of the tiniest species. Yeah. Even the wild forms of colchicum are often much larger. So there's many large flowered forms of, uh, of wild colchicum as well. And native habitat, same? Same, Mediterranean basin, right around the yeah. northern parts of the Mediterranean mainly. So you'll see them growing in the alpine meadows in, in Greece and Turkey into Italy, all through those areas you'll find colchicums growing. Mm. It's a slightly, well, no, it's actually a substantially smaller genus than the crocuses, mm. but there are still innumerable species, some of which flower in the autumn, some of which are winter flowering, uh, and there's even some spring flowering colchicums, and they're not all mauve or white. Uh, there's also yellow ones. Yeah. Uh, so they come in a range of different shapes, sizes, flowering periods, and colours. There you go. Pot culture then, 
Full sun, dappled shade. Uh, I'd give them full sun. They like a good dry summer dormancy. Can uh, they be baked? If they're uh, I don't know that I'd bake them specifically, mm. but I'd keep them out in a fairly open aspect for their drying off period during the summer months. Mm. And of course, remember that all of these plants can also be ground grown as well. I was so. about to say, they'd all need fairly well drained soil, wouldn't they? Oh yes, because bulbs, there's very few bulbs in the world that actually like to be damp when they're dormant. Mm. So they need to have good drainage and they need to be somewhere where you're not irrigating madly during their dormancy because that will, of course, cause them all sorts of grief and issues. And talking about both pot and garden culture then, do you, I mean, particularly maybe for pots, would you need to be feeding them? And if you do, when? When is uh, the key point? There's a lot of dispute over feeding bulbs, I have yes. to say. And lots of people say you feed your bulbs as they finish flowering. Mm. Uh, I don't agree with that at all yes. uh, for any bulb that I can think of. The thing with pot culture with most of these bulbs, you'll need to repot them comparatively regularly, once every year or once every two years. You wouldn't leave them in the same potting mix for too long a period. Right. So what I normally do is when I pot them up at the first season, I will put some slow release, nine to 12 month uh, slow release fertilizer with them when I pot them. Mm -hmm. That will slowly release as the bulb goes on right through its growing season. Yeah. And it'll be more or less expended by the time the bulb goes into its dormancy again. If in fact I want to keep it in the same pot for a following year, then I would top up with a little bit of the slow release fertilizer again. Again, in that sort of late summer, autumn period when the root system is just starting to move again, mm. uh, it's going to be out there searching for nutrient and things to push the bulbs up. Mm. And so I would always feed just as the bulbs break their dormancy. Right. That would be my, my thing with those. And as a potting mix, would you mix sand with a regular potting mix just to keep it light yeah, and airy? It depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're making your own potting mix at home, well, then you've got to adjust it for different types of bulbs anyway, mm. because woodlandy bulbs like a much higher yeah. uh, humus level than uh, uh, plants that might come from open scree areas and things. So you'd probably need to adjust your potting mix a bit. Uh, but certainly most commercial potting mixes could do with a little bit more gritty stuff in it mm. before you'd use them for most bulbs. Okay, well, there we go. Colchicum 101. And the last cab here before we go into your garden. Yeah, and have a look at one or two of mine. John has supplied us with uh, a tiny, tiny little iris. And it is very, very beautiful. Look and that. there's a couple of rogues in there. Um, <laughs> so yes, they haven't turned out to all be the same variety. It's supposed to be a form of iris reticulata called happiness. Mm -hmm. I think it's happiness or happily or happy something, happiness. And it is a cheery little yellow. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the creamy white one with the purple sort of markings in it is, but it's a sort of a happy incident and it's quite nice. But these little irises, again, they like plenty of sun. Mm -hmm. They come from mainly Mediterranean climates. They go right through into, well, some of them grow in Iran and Iraq and places like that as well. Mm. They need a completely dry summer dormancy. So you would put these somewhere where they're completely sheltered from uh, the weather. Or with some of these things, you might even tap the bulbs out and keep them dry and then repot them again. Yeah. But if you can keep them nice and dry, there's no reason why you can't grow some of these dainty little things in pots. There's no one way to grow mm. this huge <clears throat> genus. The species one particularly. Well, there you go. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. We should cover some more ground and go and look at the things winter in the ground. flowering bulbs <laughs> in your yeah. garden. Yes, I have to say one of my all time favorites when it comes to these little tiny bulbous and again this isn't a true bulb it's a it's a rhizome uh, but one of my favorite little ones is the winter aconite the winter aconite is a tiny little plant and it has a woody little bulby thing underneath it it's botanically known as aranthus hymalis and i love the fact that it gets this beautiful green almost elizabethan rough of foliage and then the little golden yellow flower sits in the middle it's a woodlander so it likes permanently shady aspect. This has a bamboo screen behind it that keeps it shaded all summer. It just gets enough light for it to get going. It self seeds itself mildly around in my garden here. Uh, and I think it's an absolute little gem and certainly well worth having in any sort of quantity you can build up in the garden. So there it is, Aranthus hymalis, the winter aconite. Now you could grow this in a pot, uh, there's no reason why not. It would need a cool dryish summer dormancy without being dry dry. A little hint though, the little woody tubers underneath it or rhizomes 
uh, they look like another component of the potting mix and are really hard to find. I spent years trying to work out which bits were pine bark and which bits were rhizomes until I realised I could deal with the plants just as they were starting to break in the spring. So they all had a little green shoot on them and I could find them really easily. Well, Stephen, on this windy day, yes. that was an amazing wrap up of winter flowering bulbs. And they are bringing joy and cheer. They certainly are. And at least they stay close to the ground where they're a little more protected to the wind than we are. <laughs> yes. I'm, I, you know, I think my favourite out of everything is the cyclamen. Yeah, they are charming little plants. Mm. And no matter how small your garden, you should have acres of those. Yes. Mm. Or how big or small your window ledge, patio, yeah, exactly. balcony. You could grow any of these, really. Oh, you could. You don't actually have to have a garden to grow miniature bulbs. So, no. uh, the only, I guess the only other thing I'd say about them is, of course, they spend a lot of time underground. So mm. you're going to have a lot of what look like empty pots mm. for a fair percentage of the year mm. for the payoff that you get when they come into flower. So you've got to be aware of that as well. Well, there you go. Well, this has been wonderful. Many thanks, John, for bringing over a part, a tiny part of your collection of rare bulbs. We are very grateful. How could we top this, Stephen Ryan? Well, I A don't know. A little top dressing of <laughs> yes. organic material. Yes, I'm not sure how we can top this particular segment, but we'll have something interesting and different to do next week. So do hit subscribe. We post every Friday. And if you've got a question for Stephen Ryan, horticultural guru, put it in the comments below and we will answer it, well, you will, every yes. Monday in 60 seconds. Exactly. So until next week, we'll see you then. Bye all.